Hi everyone, I'm Eric, and today we'll be continuing to learn number theory. Now today's topic will be mainly about Euler's、uh, Euler's phi function and the Chinese remainder theorem. Now last lesson we said that、uh, we found that Euler's formula is this. But an important aspect of the Euler's formula is phi m, and unless we find a effect, an effective way to actually calculate phi m, then Euler's formula won't be much use. So, for example, if it's phi one million, it will be almost impossible to calculate by hand. So, in order to solve that problem, we Have to find a pattern, a quick way to solve phi m. Now we already know if it's phi a prime number, it, it will be very very easy. So for example, it's phi thirteen. We already know that thirteen is a prime, and so the only factors of thirteen are one and itself, which is at thirteen. So there are twelve numbers which are relatively prime to thirteen, which are smaller than thirteen itself. So we take the prime numbers as our test subject, and we make a list. So p and q, they are both prime numbers, and j and k, well, they can be any number. And we have this and this. We multiply them together to get this, and we use p to the jth power to get phi, p to the jth power, q to the kth power to get phi. To, Q to the kth power, and use their their.、Uh, we multiply them together to get phi p to the jth power times q to the kth power. And actually, looking at this list, we find a very interesting fact that phi to the p、uh, phi p to the jth power times q to the jth power is actually phi p to the Uh, phi p to the jth power times phi q to the kth power, and so according to this list, we should be able to say that phi p to the jth power times q to the kth power equals phi p to the jth power times q phi q to the kth power. Now, as always, we have to. Consider how useful this actually is, or else it won't be much use in proving it. And in fact, as always, it is very very useful. So,、uh, let's let's just use a and nine. So phi eight, phi eight is, as we know, two to the third power. And a quick way to solve this is we see that two is a prime. So. Every two numbers, there will be a number that is not relatively prime to two to the third power. And how many numbers are not relatively prime to two to the third power? Well, there are in total two to the third power numbers. And if we divide that number by two, we have two to the second、uh, two squared. So we have a、uh, phi two cubed. Uh, I my brain had finally worked now that two to the third power is also is a k a two cubed, so phi two cubed is basically two cubed minus two squared, to, and we get four. Using the same tactic, we find that phi nine is six, nine minus three, and then we can find. Phi to the seventy, a、uh, phi seventy-two. Now, if we do not use this method, it will be a very. It will cost us a very long time to calculate this small number. But using that method, it will be very easy. Four times as four times six, which is twenty-four. So now we want to prove the phi function formulas. So the first one is. If p is a prime and k is greater than or equal to one, two one, then phi p to the kth power equals p to the kth power minus p to the k minus oneth power. And we had just casually proved it and just walked away over here. So 
there's only one thing left for us to prove, which is if G C if M and N are relatively prime, which is actually which is basically all that this means. Then phi to the M N uh, phi M N equals phi M times phi N. And in order to prove this, which is quite complicated, we make them into uh, we divide them into two lists. The first list, of course, phi M N is well this is the start of the list there is a number in this list a and a fulfills the following uh, a fulfills the following limitations oh m n and they are relatively prime and that's the end of the list. And this is just phi m n's definition. On to the second list, phi m times phi n. Now let's say it's a ordered pair called b and c. And b and c both fulfills these limitations with b and m associated. and C and N associated. And that is the end of the list. And we already know that this is definitely equal to this since it's the definition. Now, is this equal to this? Uh, namely, how many ordered pairs B, C are there? Well, I mean, B, C, two, uh, two things that we've got to concern. B have phi m probabilities, and C have phi m probabilities, and so they're equal. Now, we want to actually get on an example, or else just having this, it's already quite complicated. So what we are going to do is we're going to set m to 4, set n to 5. Or you can set m to 5, n to 4, whatever. Uh, now phi m n. This list contains 8 numbers, 1, 3, 7, 9. 11, 13, 17, and 19, these eight numbers, and on to phi m times phi n. It contains eight ordered pairs, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, on to the next line, 2, 1, 2, 2, uh, oops brain isn't working too well today. Three one three two three three and of course three two uh three four and that is the end of the list. And surprisingly I mean not not surprisingly uh, not not surprisingly since we already see this coming there are eight ordered pairs. Well, there are exactly eight numbers, and uh, there's the same number of elements in both uh, both lists. And now we are going to see if we can associate these two sets together. And this is the and this is how we associate them together. We say that a and M and B uh, A is congruent to B modulo M and is congruent to C modulo N. And the question is can we associate the eight numbers in set A with the eight worded pairs in set B? And the answer is we actually can. So we can associate one with one, one, three with three, three, 
And if we go on and on until 19, 3 and 4, we found, uh, we can find that we had finished the job. So the only two parts left to us to prove. The first part, uh, in the first set A, every time in the first set A, must have an ordered pair, distant cousin, in set B. And the second part, in set, every ordered pair in set B, uh, must be uh, fitting to at least one element in set A. So first we're going to prove the first part, of course. So we say that A1, A2, they have the same ordered pair in the other list. And why do we say that? Because basically that is the way to prove the first part. So A1 is congruent to A2 modulo M as well as N. And it takes much, and it takes much shorter time to speak it rather than write it. So since M and N are relatively prime, we have that A one is congruent to A two modulo M N, and we know that every element in set A should be smaller than M N, and if they are smaller than M N, then except the same terms, there will never be an occasion where A1 is congruent to A2 modulo Mn. So we have to finish the proof of the first part. On to the second part. The second part is actually quite important. And it is so important, it deserves a name. So I actually don't know the English name, even though I know the Chinese name. So the second part, it, it, the theorem it states that M and N are integers with them relatively prime and of course B and C integers as well and these uh, this set, a set of congruences A is congruent to B modulo M and x is congruent to c modulo n. This set of congruences have one and only one solution with the solution inside this area. So how are we going to prove it? Well, first things first, we're going to see an example. Big, big example. So we're going to just do this a is con x is congruent to eight modulo eleven x is congruent to what a uh, three modulo nineteen and if this is true then we can we can derive an equation where x equals eleven y plus eight and if we substitute it over here we have x is congruent to 14 modulo 19. Oh no, actually not x. Uh, wait, actually x were not x. Oh my gosh. My brain is not functioning extremely well today, is it? Now it is, uh, it is quite a magical change, but so we substitute this into this. We have 11y plus 8 is congruent to 3 modulo 19. And we move the 8 to the right side. And we have 11y is congruent to negative 5 modulo 19. And we do not want negatives. No, 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 never. So we add negative 5 by 19. And we have this. And it's not as magical. No. So... We, we, I mean, we know how to solve this, and we're going to invite our old friend, Euclidean Mesa, over here. And we have 11y plus 19, let's say z, equals 14. And we do not want that, so let's just enter 
Enter U and V. Exit Y and Z. Wait, that actually rhymes. Never thought it would. One. Yes, one. And we're going to write it as quickly as possible because we do not want to waste too much time in these calculations. And we're done. Oh, we're not done. So let's say A is 19 with B 11. Then we have 8, A minus B, 3, A minus B plus B, 2 times B minus A, 2, and we're going to write a 1 over here. 2 is 2B minus, uh, oops, 2 is A minus B minus 4B plus 2A, which gives us 3A plus, ah, uh, oops, minus 5B. And my brain had somehow worked it out. And 1 is, ah, uh, it's, 8, no, 7B, minus 4A. And there we have it, the first set of uh, solutions. With our interest in U, not in V. So, we have these equations. Uh, we have these solutions, and remember this 14. So we have to time all these solutions by 14. And my hand will probably get very tired just doing this. Okay, clear out a big enough space right here. So we have 98. And 98 is way, way bigger than 19. So we can simplify it to 3. So we have y1 equals 3. And we substitute it to get x1 equals 41. And if we check it, we find ourselves correct. I might say, well, 41 is much, much bigger than 19 as well. Well, 41 is just the solution, and we can just simplify it by sub sub subtracting and get it. Uh, actually, we don't even need to subtract it because 11 times 19 is way, 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 way bigger than 41. So, we had finished this example, and now we can finally move on from the example to uh, algebra, yay. Well, oops, forgot to change color, whatever. From this congruence, we can always get x is equal to my plus b and substituting it to this congruence. We have my equals, oh no, it's congruent to uh, c minus b modulo n. And this always has one and only one solution, y1. If we substitute it back, we have x1 equals m y1 plus b. Surely a complicated journey, isn't it? Well, and we are finally done because this is one and the only one solution to this, uh, to, 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 to these congruences. And we have proved the theory with the name I do not know, and we had also proved the second five function formula. Now there is a bit of history, uh, historical interlude, and it is from AD 300. Very, very impressive. Uh, Sun Tao uh, Xuan Qing mentioned it in volume 3, problem 26. And this is obviously not Chinese. Uh, it's just a translation. So we have a number of things. We do not know exactly how many things there are. 
If we count them by threes, we have two left over. Count them by fives, three left over. Count them by sevens, we have two left over. How many things are there? Now, it's, it's from AD 300, and it is very impressive because it is actually congruences, if you think about it. So we're not going to say solve it just now. We will, though, definitely find a time in the future to just solve this historical interlude, which is, you know, from AD 300, considering a question in 2023 very very impressive so that will be it for today and see you next time